No pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in, stand up, and let the wind blow. Because there's hope. hope amen the, the theme for our uh, our series during during advent is the light of hope in a in a dark world and so we're going to be talking about that as we march through this advent time with the candles each one getting us closer uh, to christmas eve when we celebrate uh, that, that the messiah has come uh, and we, we pass the light to each other and say, uh, Jesus is the light of the world so if you haven't been to a, a christmas eve i encourage you to come if you I encourage you to come on Christmas Eve, and uh, we're barring something going wrong and us not being able to be in the in the building. Uh, we're planning on having our Christmas Eve uh, service here uh, together. So I just want to encourage you to be a part of that. In fact, out in the info booth, we have like a, a business card kind of thing. You can invite people uh, to come and be a part of that uh, as well. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, we live in a dark world in so many ways, amen? I mean, you, you turn on the news or you look at any of that, there's just so many hard uh, things that are, that are happening. Uh, and so I know for some people, it feels like the darkness is closing in. I know this time of year is when uh, people come into my office to talk more uh, because of it feels like that. And there's just, there's just hard stuff uh, in the midst of that. But the, the good news is, for those of us that follow Christ, we have hope in him. Amen. Yeah, he, he is, is our hope, and all that we're doing now is a, is a part of that celebration uh, and a part of, of this season in which we call you to remember. In fact, um, Advent season is for remembering core values, uh, our core values as God's people. It's a time to remember, not in the sense that you think, oh yeah, but this active remembering that we do in the church of Jesus Christ, like when we take communion, that's active kind of remembering of what's going on. And, and so this Advent season is that too. So we do things like our chrisman tree with our children. Wasn't that fun to see the group of kids up there, you know? Uh, and the chrismans are, are Christ symbols. And so each one of those represents, represents Christ in some sort of way. And it's one of the ways we teach our children because they create a Christ symbol and we tell them what it means and, and then they come up and we bring them in front of the congregation and they, they put it on the tree and the chrisman tree reminds us of, of the things that are our values, the things that matter uh, with, within our faith. And, and we do each one of these with the, the lighting of the candle. We, we're doing hope this morning. But, but we have some others. The, the whole list of them is hope, peace, joy, love, and the birth of Jesus. Those are what we kind of celebrate uh, through, through uh, Advent season. Hope this week and peace next week and then joy and love, uh, which kind of is what leads to all of those. And finally, the, the birth of Christ on, on Christmas Eve as we gather uh, in, in his name. And so um, the ultimate one is this birth of Jesus because we believe that God took on human flesh and came and lived and dwelt amongst us. Amen. And that is, that is good news that our God loves us that much. Not that he would stand off and shout instructions at us, you know. Hey, you, clean up your act, you know. No, 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 over, th oh, come on. That, that, that's not our God. Our God came and experienced what we experienced, was tempted in the ways we are tempted, and struggled with the things we have struggled with. And so, uh, so what we really want to talk about today, we want to kind of drill down in that a little bit, is this hope in the darkness, Hope in the, the midst of the times when it seems like there's no hope, when it's all dark, we don't know where to go. Uh, I, I think we've all experienced the joy of trying to navigate in the dark, amen? You know, I mean, this is particularly true when you're in those child-rearing years, you know, and you want to go in and check on your child, and you discover in your bare feet that they left a Lego in the room somewhere, you know, and you jump around on one foot trying not to wake them up, you know? I used to think we had it the worst because we had Legos. And then I was reminded that my parents' generations had jacks. Ugh, you know? But in the dark, we can't see. We don't know where to go. It's confusing. And so um, we're going to talk about that in this world in which we live, in which it just it seems to be filled with anger and violence and revenge and 
distrust and hatred and brokenness and fear is, is, is everywhere. And it would be easy for us to get discouraged in, in the midst of all of that. And yet, the Bible is filled with hope in the midst of difficult circumstances. In fact, if you kind of look at the broad spectrum of the stories in the Bible, almost all of them are about someone that's in a difficult circumstance, in a, in a place of darkness, and God breaks in in some kind of way, whether it be the Old Testament stories of slavery and deliverance or taking the promised land, or, or whether those are the New Testament stories where someone is blind or they're, they're crippled or, or all of those sorts of things. God is always breaking in uh, in the midst of it. He's always bringing hope in the darkness. It's just kind of the way God works. In fact, the heroes of the Bible accomplished what they did because they did not believe that the rulers of this world got the final word. They didn't believe that the darkness gets a vote in the outcome of how things are to go. And they would, they would trust God. They would put their hope in God, despite the fact that all the evidence said they shouldn't do that. I mean, just think about some of these stories. Think about little old David, who was a boy when he took on Goliath. You know, the whole army of Israel is afraid of Goliath because he's like this giant guy with his big spear and, and, and David's this, this little guy in the midst of it. But David didn't believe that Goliath got the last word. He believed God got the last word. So he had hope and he won because God does get the last word. Or, or you think about Noah who, who built an ark despite the fact that he had never even seen rain and everybody was making fun of him for it. And yet... He didn't believe that the people around him got the last word. The darkness didn't get the last word. God did, and he saved his family through that. Or Moses, who, who led the people out of slavery, who didn't believe that Pharaoh got the last word, who was the most powerful man in the world at that point. He believed God got the last word, and God got the last word. Or, or even Joshua, who was commanded to take the land of Israel for his people, but, but they reported, oh, there's, there's giants in the land. And, and Joshua didn't believe that the giants got the last word. He believed that God got the last word. Somebody say amen in here. Because whatever giant you are facing, whatever the situation that feels like the darkness, I want you to know that you have hope. Amen. And the darkness doesn't get the last word. And hope is what we hold on to when all else is gone, when it's dark, when it seems like there's nothing else left. And so if you are here this morning and you are experiencing that darkness, if you're experiencing that dark place and it's difficult and you want to give up, I am here to tell you there is hope in Jesus Christ. Don't give up. Don't give up. God has something for you. He wants to fill your tank and provide a way out. In fact, Hope reminds us that God has a better future for us than our present reality. Amen. Right? I mean, I don't care even if your life is going good. There's some areas of your life that probably are not. There's some areas where you could see improvement. There are areas where it's like, God, if you could really work in that sort of, sort of thing. And, and that's the truth of this. Hope reminds us that God has a better future. In fact, this is what theologians call God's prefer, preferred future. You know, it sounds really, but it just means that God has a better future than what's going on. God hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't misplaced you. You, you have not fallen off God's radar screen. God is at work in your life. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is at work in your life. Yeah. And so this morning, I, I want us to look at a, a passage of Scripture you're going to be familiar with because I use it for benediction uh, a lot, but, it, it, but it's a super important uh, Scripture to understand in its context, and it's one where the context really does kind of uh, matter uh, for how it's put together. So let me, let me give you, the, he, Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and the church at Rome is in huge conflict. They are having the, the church fight of, of all church fights. Uh, and it's all about politics and racism. Kind of sound like today, you know, kind of a thing. And, and there's this racial tension between the Jews who think they're better than the Gentiles. And, and the Gentiles want to be a part of the leadership and the Jews don't want them to be a part. And the Jews aren't even sure that the Gentiles are really worthy of God's love. And, and so that kind of thing is going on. So there's this huge racial tension. And in the midst of that, verse 7, he writes, accept one another. And that's not a suggestion, that's a command. Accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So despite all of their differences, he says, accept one another. It's not okay for you to reject each other in the body of Christ. 
And, and then he goes on to, to list several scriptures that are kind of songs of the Gentiles and how God loves the Gentiles and, and they're a part of it. And then, in the midst of all of the pain and all of the suffering, he writes these words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I use this as a benediction usually at the end of the sermon when we're all going, yay, God, and I bring this up, and it's like, yay, God. But we forget that this was written in the middle of a giant church fight. They did not like each other. They were separated, and they were away from each other. They were saying terrible things about each other. It was way worse than it is today. And in the midst of that, Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. That would come off as snarky in that kind of a thing. You know, are you making fun of me here? There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no hope. Those Gentiles, they're, they're useless. Say amen, because we're all, gen- most of us are Gentiles probably, you know. I mean, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. I love this. I love this, that our God is a God of hope. Say God of hope. Yeah. God is our hope. That's what that means. God of hope. It doesn't mean that it's something that he does every once in a while because he's feeling generous. It means it's into his very nature that God brings hope wherever he goes. I've told you over and over again, wherever Jesus went, he made people's lives better. And that's that, that God of hope. It's his very nature. And wherever God is allowed to reign, there, there will be hope. God can't help himself. He always comes to make things better, to bring hope where, wherever he goes and, and whatever it is. May the God of hope And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Do you know what the next couple of uh, sermons are about? Peace and then joy, right? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I love that the Holy Spirit is the maker of this hope and the joy and the peace and the overflowing nature uh, of the whole thing. And and that image of overflowing is, is so good because overflowing things are messy. Have you noticed, you know? like when the, the kids like do their own milk and then it overflows. There is no good ending to your child saying, the milk is overflowing, right? It's just bad. It's going to be everywhere. And it's always going to flow to, you know, whatever piece of electronics you have or fly lying around or onto the floor or across the carpet or, or what. That, that's just, the, that it, overflowing is a messy word. And I love that he uses this word, that the God of hope would fill you with joy and peace and trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. So that you become so filled in the midst of all of these difficult things and all of these scary things and all of these darkness that you would be overflowing with hope and it'd get all over your friends who think they don't have hope. That it'd get all over everything. It'd just ruin their bad mood, you know? And and, and they just couldn't, because hope was flowing out of these people they call Christians and, and what they were doing. Hope is messy, and I love that hope is messy. But there's a, there's a part of this we need to look at a little bit. I, I heard a theologian say uh, the other day, um, the difficulty with Scripture is we have people who speak in, in English who are reading texts that were originally written in Greek by people who thought like Hebrews. See the problem? This is why they made me go to school forever and learn all of those languages. And so one of the things that that I know whenever I do these is when we use the English word hope, when you think of hope, you're probably not thinking very close to actually what the original writer intended on that. When we think of the word hope, we tend to think of something that's tentative or, or uncertain or hesitant, or unsure, or or provisional. In fact, we use it to describe the long shot, right? So, so, you know, if someone says to me, I hope it doesn't rain much this winter, most of us locals are just going to laugh at them, right? You know, it's like, it's going to rain, and it's going to rain a bunch. Just get over it, right? You know, that's the way. Or if I were to say, I hope the Seahawks make the playoffs, yeah, yeah, I'll see you next right here, yeah. They t- tell me that statistically it's still possible, but it's not going to happen, right? You know, I would love it to happen, but it's just, it's, it's not going to happen. So when we use the word hope, we, we don't, we, there, there's, there's, it's improbable is what we mean when we use hope. But it, it's still maybe tiny, but it, it's improbable, and it'd be really cool if it would happen, but don't, don't get your hope set on it. Hope, right, you know? The interesting thing is that uh, when it comes to both the Greek and the Hebrew, that's not what the word that they, they use means at all. That word that gets translated hope, uh, here, here it is. The Greek word for hope is elpis. Say elpis. 
The Hebrew word is chava. Say chava. Okay, you got to get it down your throat, and the person in front of you should feel something on the back of their head. So chava. Yeah, chava. It's, it's kind of hard. Chava, chava. I want, I want you to remember that word because we're going to talk about that one. But the interesting thing is that, that both the Greek and the Hebrew, it, it means expectation or anticipation with confidence. So in some ways, it's just the opposite. It carries the idea that this is going to happen, but it's not here yet. In fact, the Hebrew word is really, really strong. It carries the idea of binding something to another thing. So the image is, is that God binds us to himself to protect us and to watch over us and to be with us. And they use strong cords. It's a word that kind of refers to the business of, of building ropes in, in their life. And if you've ever been around uh, how they, they build a rope, it starts out with a very small string usually of some sort, you know, and it gets wound around other strings, and then that set of strings gets wound around other strings, and you can keep winding, and you can keep winding, and you can keep winding, and the more strings you wrap around that, the stronger the, the, the rope is, to the point that you can make ropes that it's nearly impossible for, for them to be broken, and that, that God has made these around you, and so uh, when I think of this, um, I, I, this mind, this is just powerful for me, because I grew up right on the coast. I grew up in Grays Harbor, right? And in Grays Harbor, when I was growing up, there were really only two industries. Uh, everything was attached to them. One of them was logging, and the other of them was shipping, because they would take the logs or the pulp from the mill and ship that someplace else. And so the big entertainment in Grays Harbor on Friday was watching the, uh, the loggers and, and the uh, longshoremen go to the bar and fight each other. It was just kind of their thing. It was a long tradition. In fact, it was such a big deal that in the early days of Grace Harbor, the, beer, the, uh, the uh, taverns were built out over the water, and they would conk guys on the head and drop them through, and they would wake up serving on a ship somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. So it was quite a, quite a big deal. But one of the things I learned about longshoremen is, is the ropes that they use are pretty amazing. Because where I was at, these were not boats. These were ships that they were bringing into the, into the harbor there. And they made gigantic ropes. And so here's a kind of a picture of it. You, you can see this guy here. He can't even get his hand around it. That's how big that rope is. He can get part of it, but he can't get all the way around it. And, and you can see the multiple ropes there. Uh, and, how, and he has one of the smaller ones. Some of these down here are even bigger. And how giant that cleat is compared, compared to him. Because they, they would haul ships in close, but a rope has a little give in it so that when things are happening, you know, it wouldn't, a chain would, would tear things apart because it has no give in it. And so they would use these giant ropes. And so the image for me when I, when I, I think about this passage is the idea, God uses that kind of rope and he binds himself, binds you to him. Talk about hope in the world. I'm with the big guy, you know? That, that's kind of the image they, they have here, this, this certainty about it. there's nothing that can go, go wrong with this. In, 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 in Chava, there, there's no uncertainty at all. And it's so different from ours of uncertainty. In fact, we wouldn't say things like, I hope the sun comes up tomorrow, right? You're going like, what do you mean? The sun's coming up whether you like it or not. It may be cloudy and we may not see it, but the sun is coming up tomorrow. Amen? Okay? You know? But it, for Hebrew, they would say, Chava, I chava, the sun comes up tomorrow. I hope the sun comes up tomorrow because they absolutely know that the sun is going to come up. And the issue isn't so much whether or not it's going to come up, but when it's going to come up. And that's what hope is about in Greek and Hebrew. In fact, let me say it this way. Biblically, hope is about anticipation, not uncertainty. The English word hope is about uncertainty. I don't think it's going to happen, but I hope it happens. Chava is about waiting for it to happen because I know it's going to happen and I can't wait for it to get here. For Thanksgiving, my, I told you last week, my son and his wife and my grandson uh, came up for Thanksgiving. They came up on Monday and had to leave on Friday, and so they were here for a while. And I can tell I'm a grandparent. Because like two weeks before, I'm like, they're going to be here pretty soon. I can't wait, you know? And, and then as it got closer, it's like, okay, we're only three sleeps away. I felt like a little kid, you know? And they're going to be here, you know? Crosby's going to Crosby's gonna be here. And Kevin and Sierra too. But, but Crosby's going to be here, you know? There was anticipation, and I was, I was looking forward to that and, and connecting with him. And, and it, you know, just I anticipated that, that welcome. And tomorrow morning, we're getting on a plane and flying to, to St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, to see our, our new baby daughter. And I'm in the same thing. It's like one more sleep, and then we're going to be there. 
As soon as I get done with this sermon, boom, you know. Let me get done a little early. No, no I'm just, I, I'm looking forward. So I have chava. I don't have the English word hope. I have chava. That, that it's not if, it, it's when. It, it's the future is sure. It's just not here yet, right? You, do you understand that difference? And that, that, that's such an important concept in the original language that it always frustrates me a little bit with the word hope in English because, we, well, I hope God rescues me. We got hope in God. Maybe he's going to... That's, that's not what's meant by that passage. Spiritually, hope is this idea that I have bet my life on God. I have put my trust in him. And so I have hope. I have been bound to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In fact, the whole rope thing in, in their culture was especially important because people had lots of wells, right? And so we, even today we see it. People will forget to cover a well, you know, and some kid will drop down in there or a person will drop down in there. So in the first century, if someone accidentally got dropped down into a well, you couldn't get out a giant, you know, earth mover and dig a thing and get in. So you know what they did? A dropped a rope down in there, right? And let me tell you, if you're in the bottom of a well in the first century and a rope comes down to you, that is hope. <laughs> that, that, is, that is hope. Hold on to that thing and, and get pulled out of there. And so uh, hope is such an important thing. It, it's anticipation uh, of what God is going to do in your life. And then, kind of another way of saying it, hope is a deep conviction that God's got this. That God's got it. Whatever it is in your life, no matter how hopeless it seems, no matter how dark it is, no how many things are going wrong, no matter how much your emotions are turned over and you're frustrated and, and all of this, God has got this. He's the only one that's got it, in fact. But God has got it. I trust in God no matter the circumstances or the outcome. And whatever you are facing, you can trust in God as well. It doesn't matter what the this is that you're afraid of or that's going on in your life. God's got this. Say, God's got this. Yes. But, but, God doesn't always do it the way we think he should do it. Anyone want to say amen there? I've walked with God a long time and he rarely does it my way. So here's an important part of this. Hope is trusting God's will, God's way. Hope is trusting God's will, God's will be done, the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And not only that, but that it be done the way that God would do it in our life. God has a game plan for your life, and it's better than your plan. It really is better than your plan. It may not look like what you think it should be, but trust me, God's plan is always best. But not only does God have a plan for your life, there is a way of getting to that place in your life that may be painful at times. That may be a struggle. There may be some tests along the way. There may be some times when it's going to seem dark and you need God to move in in a, in a way that, that you just feel like you have no hope and you feel like, God, what are you doing to me in all of this? And yet he is working on you and he is changing you in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that darkness. And I think this is one of the things that we, we miss a lot. I, and and I, I do this all the time. You know, when it gets dark and it gets hard and the struggle is difficult and it's painful, I pray, Lord, deliver me from this. And the Lord is going, no, 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 this is good for you. <laughs> no, 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 deliver me from this. No, it, it, it's good for you. I'm teaching you some things that you didn't seem to be able to learn before you got into this situation. Now, I don't think God puts us in, in, in positions to make us suffer. But I do think in the suffering, God teaches us and changes us and grows us and makes us more like him. Amen? Some of the best growth I've had is when I was in a difficult sort of situation. And so God's way matters as well as God's, uh, God's will in, in, in our life. Uh, and so we allow him to work in us. A part of hope is surrendering not just to his plan, but to his way of getting us in that place. And, and by the way, I mean, if you stop and think about this just for a second, if you actually believe in God and you believe that God loves you, then really God is the only one who is competent to guide your life. I mean, honestly, he loves you more than anybody else. More, whoever loves you most in the world, God loves you more. Not because they don't love you, but because God's capacity for love is higher than theirs. And, and not only that, so he, he's for you. He's absolutely for you. But in addition to that, and unlike the person on this earth that loves you, he can see the future. 
He can see over the horizon and around the corner. He sees dangers that you don't see and the people around you don't see. He understands things about the way the world works that, that make no sense to you. I mean, honestly, if you really believe God loves you and God is for you, you're crazy to not put your trust in him, to not let him have control. So here's what you need to know about hope. Hope is not believing God will give me what I want, but God will give me what is best. And those two are not the same thing. Amen? They just, they just, they're not. And when I, I think about this, I always, I think about the parent-child relationship. I love that in our tradition, we believe the foundation of, of everything is that God is love and that, that our relationship with him is not transactional, it's, re, it's relational. Our relationship is relational, that makes sense. Uh, that, that, that he cares for us as a parent cares for the child. And if you want us to understand how God works, understand how healthy relationships with parents and children work. And, and you know that, that when a child is little, they absolutely trust their parents. It's one of the things I miss about when Kevin was little, because I was a hero, man. I could do nothing wrong. It was great. Everything dad could solve, every single problem in life. And they, they put your trust in you. But, but sometimes then, you know, we, we have times where we, we struggle with that. We don't want to put our trust in that. Sometimes there's things... When Crosby got here, after all of that looking forward to him being here, you know, my son comes in, and, and last time I saw him, he was an infant, and now he's kind of moving around doing more stuff. And so my son, you know, wanted to give, give his, his son to his dad and, you know, kind of handed Crosby over, and immediately Crosby did this. <laughs> I was like, who's this dude, you know? <laughs> And, 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 you know, it was just like, uh, I don't know, I don't want to, you know. He, he has no idea. That little boy has no idea. I would die to protect him, you know. He didn't understand that. He just understands that, you know, I don't know this. This is strange. What's going on here, you know? And the good news is as time went on, then he got so I could kind of hold him if, if my son or my daughter-in-law were still in the room, you know. And, and by the end, so long as they're in the house somewhere, and he could kind of hear them, then it, then it was okay. He kind of, he kind of grew in, in, in trust, right? And, and the truth of the matter is this. Good parents do for their children what is right, not what they want. Now, if we can bring those two together at the same time, that's great. But if I have to choose, I choose to do what is right for my kids, not necessarily what they want, even at great personal cost. And, and the, the truth of the matter is, they think they know what is good for them, but they don't always. Have you noticed that? You know? They, they think they know. And, and so then they, then they get mad at you because you're not giving them what they want. You're giving them what they need. In fact, I don't think you can call yourself a good parent if at least somewhere in their growing up years they didn't say to you, I hate you, <laughs> right? How many of you, you know, at some point, it's just, it's, it's the way it is. They just don't they, don't, they don't get it. Hope is parental. God is going to give you what you need, not necessarily what you want. And sometimes we're like that little child going, oh, you're not doing this right. I don't like this. I hate you. You know, well, most of us grew up religious. We're like, oh, we wouldn't say that to God. But we say it in some sense in that we won't put our trust in him in the midst of it. And, and God is the one who wants to rescue us, who is for us, who, who loves us. Now, here's the good news about that whole thing, you know. When, they, when they're, you know, little, like, they trust you like this much. You can do no wrong. And then as they get older, it starts to come down, you know, and down and down. And then they, they hit, like, puberty in the teenage years, and it goes like this, you know. And you're on the bottom, and then you're just kind of, they're like, you know, my parents are dumb as a box of rocks. They don't know nothing, you know. <laughs> and then this wonderful thing happens. They get older, and they get married, and you come up just a little bit. And then they have kids, and you go... <laughs> All of a sudden, I don't know what to do. I'll be in this, you know. So there, there's hope. Whatever stage you're in, there, there is hope for you. So everyone puts their hope in something. Everyone puts their hope in something. It's not always the, the best things, but we all put our hope in, in, in something, some way uh, in our lives. Maybe we put our hope in hard work. My dad's, my dad's philosophy of life was, when in doubt, work harder. 
It's just kind of his approach to everything, right? You know, uh, some people put their hope in power. You know, so long as I got control, it'll be okay. Anyone want to say amen there? Oh, several of you should have. Uh, some put their, their hope in religion. Not relationship, but in religion. Or in medicine, especially when we have medical things. I've been in that place. Or fame, or intellect, or money, or education, or social skills, or charismatic leaders, or politicians, or political ideologies. Fill in the blank. I don't care. There are all kinds of things that we put our hope in that are not Jesus. And we get in trouble every time. In fact, I think the most dangerous ideas in the world are the ones that bring false hope. Because it damages us. Because we suffer. And we begin to think there is no hope because we put our hope in the wrong thing. And sure enough, it let us down. Whereas when we put our hope in Christ, he may not do it the way we want to do it, but I'm here to tell you, God gets the final word. He's the only one worthy of our hope. And people just cling to false hope. And it's like, no, let go of that so that you can embrace the the real hope. Because all that false hope will defeat you. But something happens. Something happens. So here's how you can know when you've put your hope in the wrong thing. Fear is the warning light that you've put your hope in the wrong thing. Fear is the indication that something has gone wrong. It's like that little, that little light, you know, on your dashboard of your car that comes on red. It goes ding, and it looks like a little engine, you know. The check engine light is what they call it. And the good news is when that comes on, you're not going to probably have any problems for a while. But if you leave that on long enough, you will have a date with the tow truck, you know? And anyone want to say amen? Okay, you know? It's just, it, it's just a, and, and so it is with fear. Fear is that thing that says there's something wrong. There's something wrong in, in this, this person that I'm following. There's something wrong in this relation. There's, there, there's something going on. Fear is a God-given warning light that something is wrong. In and of itself, it doesn't fix anything. But it tells you, be alert, pay attention. And so it is, I, I see so many Christians today that are struggling with so much fear. And I want to say, what you need is hope in Christ. Because fear happens when you put your hope in the wrong thing. And you know intuitively, you know spiritually something's wrong, but you, you can't put your feet on it. Maybe you put your, your hope in a political leader or you put your hope in your money or you put your hope in whatever you put your hope in. And, and when that begins to get stripped away, then you're afraid because, oh, no, I'm going to fall because my hope was in that. Fear never lies. It always tells us what's going on. And so I, I just want to encourage you, if you are living in a place of fear, God offers you Offers you a hope that that gets us past that. But the only way to have real hope is to let go of everything else and put your trust in Jesus who came to us as a baby. You see, you can't put your hope in two things. Jesus said this when he said you can't serve mammon, money, material things, and God. You, you, You have your hope in Christ or you have your hope in something else. It can't be in, in both of this. And so people say today, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to put my hope in this or that or the other thing. Uh, I, it's, it's easy to trust God when the bank account is full and your health is good and everything's going wonderful. But that's not the time that you really need to trust God. You really need to trust God when you're wondering if there's going to be a divorce or the bill collector is calling all the time or you get the bad diagnosis. And that's when in that well of that dark pit, the rope of hope comes down to you. And Christ is saying to you this morning, grab a hold. You want out of the darkness? Here is the hope that I have for you. I loved you so much that I want to offer you hope in Jesus Christ. So I would say it like this. Uh, Fears, did we just, oops, sorry, back the wrong way. Want hope? Trust Jesus with your all. Trust Jesus with your all. That's a big ask. I know that's a big ask. But I can tell you, I've walked with the Lord a long time. And I've tried doing it both ways. You know, my trust is in this and my trust is in this. I trust God, but the bank account is plan B. It never works, and in my experience, God usually takes away whatever I think is the plan B, right? You know, so now let's try that without that. 
I encourage you this morning as we sing in just a minute, and I'm going to pray for you in just a minute, let go of that thing you've put your hope in that's causing you fear and embrace the rope of Jesus Christ. Embrace the hope that he offers you. And it is my prayer that when you embrace that hope and God gives that to you, that he will just fill you up to overflowing and the hope that he puts in your life will get messy all over all of your friends. And he will spread the hope in the world because we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. Amen? Amen. And we are pointing ourselves, we are redirecting ourselves in this time of Advent towards Christmas Eve when we'll gather in this place and we'll hear the story of what Jesus has done and his birth and we will light the Christ candle and put out all the other candles and we'll turn off all the lights and block everything and there'll be this one teeny tiny light and I will take the light from that and I'll pass it to my wife and I will say, Jesus, Jody, Jesus is the light of the world. And when my kids were small, we would then pass it to them and Kevin Jesus is the light of the world. And Kevin would pass it to Jana. Jana, Jesus is the light of the world. And it would begin to spread and we'd go around and there's a lot of people in here usually and so we'd have to send out missionaries to the dark corners of the sanctuary, you know. Here's what I know. Jesus is the only hope of the world. And he offers you the rope. Father God, Lord, I am thankful that most of the people in this room have put their hope in you. All of the rest of the stuff is just stuff. Stuff that it's nice to have in our life, stuff that makes our lives more comfortable, but our hope, our trust is in you. So Father, I pray especially for that one this morning that maybe knows that their trust hasn't been in you and that they need to do that, that there isn't peace in their life, there's, there's fear. And they, they need hope, they need this real thing that's, that's not tentative but sure. It's not here yet, but it's, it's a sure thing, Father. And so I pray, Father, that even right now, they would turn their life over to you, that they would come to you in, in, the, in this time and, and say, I need that hope, and let go of the others. And Father, that you would come in and you'd change and transform your, their lives, that you'd forgive them of the sins of the past, and that you would make them into a new creation, even this very morning, that our hope might be in you. And we ask this in the powerful name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ.